Welcome back to Trumpet Momentum. I'm Jason here in the Denver showroom at Harrelson Trumpets. If you've never seen one of our live videos before, this is your opportunity to learn about brass playing and trumpet specifically, but I cover all the brass instruments, and ask me questions so I can help you become a better performer, a better player, and help you overcome some of the challenges that uh, maybe have been there all along the entire time you've been playing, or that have come up recently. Regardless, uh, my goal always with Trumpet Momentum live videos and the Produce series is to help all of you become better players. So remember, we do these every Friday at 11 a.m. Next week will be the last time we do uh, this live video series this year. And that's because I have uh, some other commitments all the other Fridays until January. So I will be gone the rest of the year. However, there will be a lot of extra content that is added to the Trumpet Momentum website. So those of you who are advanced members, you'll see a lot more. Intermediate members, you guys will see um, some new produced videos as well. And uh, everyone else, you're not going to see as much on this channel for Trumpet Momentum specifically, but all of you will get to see quite a few reviews on trumpets and especially mouthpieces because I put together a lot, a lot of content, a lot of material for you guys to digest. Um, today's topic is uh, compound intervals. We're also going to review parallel lip compression. Uh, if you were here last Friday or the Friday before, we've really been spending time on parallel lip compression because it makes such a difference in your range, endurance, tone production, and really just your ability to play any note at any time. So those are really big, important things. Today I'm wearing gloves because I'm going to be demonstrating all of this on the Muse MMXX Safari trumpet. And that trumpet has not been released yet. Um, we're going to release it today. And uh, I, I have so many commitments today, I'm not sure I'll even get the photos up on the website, but you can at least see it in this video. And uh, this is the instrument I'll be playing. Some of you already know this, but we have three Muse demos in the Harrelson showroom. Now we finished almost every order for Muse trumpets. The only ones that weren't finished are either at plating or um, have you know undecided elements. Uh, like the, the client is waiting to tell us something because they're not ready. So all the other Muse trumpets have been finished and we've given everyone an opportunity to come to Harrelson Trumpets and to play test the modular Muse trumpets that we have in stock. And now we're gonna release them. They will be for sale on the website. This is the first time this year we've had a Muse trumpet for sale without you having to order it and wait months or longer to get it. So this one is very special. I specifically built it um, to test some engraving uh, techniques and to have really beautiful photos of a brushed silver Muse trumpet. So this one is a little different than your normal Muse. I put the wider contour finger rings on it and it's got this really cool engraving in the bell crook all the way around. It's very deep engraving. And uh, on the tuning slide, I did this very interesting and delicate elephant, which I did for fun. And on the back side, some butterflies. I really made all those uh, artwork things on this trumpet because I was trying to test how detailed I could engrave and what layers, what levels, uh, depth of field in the lens I could use. So this video really isn't about this horn, but I want you to know, because somebody's gonna ask, why are you wearing the black gloves? It's because I wanna keep this beautiful brand new demo trumpet new for whoever purchases it. Okay, so let me find my mouthpiece. And since it is a trumpet equipped with the VGR system, I want to make sure I have an insert that's going to fit me. So I'm going to put one in there right now. And looks like we have a number eight. I don't know the venturi size, but that's a gap of 80 thousandths of an inch. So I'll screw that back on. And now I can play the trumpet. And I'm going to start with this Spectratone Yellow because that is what is sitting here. So what I just played 
or my half step intervals. Those of you who've been working with Trumpet Momentum for the last several months, or maybe even just you joined a few weeks ago, uh, we start somewhat in the beginning with uh, the exercises on intervals. And that really never ends. Um, I mean, that's not all we do, but you're always working on intervals. So today we're gonna to be talking about compound intervals. Um, so I'm gonna dive into that. First, I wanna say thank you to all of our advanced, intermediate, and beginner level members. All of you make a difference and you create the possibility for me to do these videos. Um, if you don't know this already, uh, YouTube charges you a price to watch these videos. I get 70%, so they take a 30% cut. And that is what funds my time to uh, put my energy into this project. The more people we get uh, on Trumpet Momentum, the more people that subscribe, the more time I will put into it. So right now we're at 52 members this month, and it varies month by month, but it's kind of, um, this series has fluctuated between 45 and 55, so 52 or something is, is kind of um, where the average has been. And um, if we got it up to 100, then I will put literally twice as much time in. This will accelerate things, we'll move faster, and we'll have more live sessions. What I'd like to do starting in January is have a 15 to 20 minute practice session, five days a week, probably on weekdays, um, where you guys can play along with me. And I would just come into the showroom uh, at a certain time of the day, and I would practice through our trumpet momentum exercises and routines, and you guys could play along with me from home or school or wherever you might be. So if that's something that interests you, please write it in the comments, say, hey, I'd be down for that. I would totally want to practice virtually together. Um, because some of the stuff is challenging, some of it's not, some of it is, is just stuff you have to do again and again, right? And it's more fun and easier to stay on track if you have some commitment, someone to be, um, uh, I guess, to be accountable to, you know? So if we could be accountable to each other and I show up every day and I practice and you're practicing on the other end, then that could be a good thing. So, um, and then the other thing I wanna say is advanced and intermediate members always get priority on questions on the videos. Now, today it's Friday, 11 a.m. This is our regular time. We typically only get 20 or 30 people at this time, but we have 30 advanced members, so it works out, right? Uh, those of you who do have questions and you want to get off topic because you're an advanced member, throw me off topic. I'll find a space in this video to address your concerns and hopefully do it with priority so we make sure we get to you while you're on here. Uh, that's an advantage of being an advanced member. Uh, if you want to become a member, just click the join button on my YouTube page. And when you click join, if you choose advanced, then you're going to get access to the written and the produced videos. So the written exercises, produced videos. Um, and you also get access to me. So if you have specific questions you want to work through, you can just email me and I will work with you within reason. You know, if I have the time to, to give you, I will. Um, Steven says, that would be excellent for all the reasons you mentioned. Always looking for s someone to play along with. Yeah, and it, you know, as we do more and more of those exercises um, and the regular playing sessions, the idea is to um, have more of a free form flow to it as well. And you'll see what that means. But um, basically there are a lot of things that we can be doing in our, ex in our um, practice routine that makes it way more fun than just playing the Arvins again and again. Nothing wrong with Arvins, but we can spice it up and make it a lot more fun. Okay, so I am going to play the whole tone exercise, the first one we did, which is this. So I went up above C. Um, for those of you who have been in for about six months, then you guys can start to expand that. Now we can start to do these all the way up to, you know, maybe G if you want. once in a while. I, I land on a note, I just pause for a minute. Well, I, I don't normally warm up and I haven't warmed up today. This is the first time I've picked up a trumpet in a couple days. 
And um, for me, I'm feeling out my aperture control and my vibration. So I'm ensuring that what I'm putting in here in terms of the, the aperture size and the airflow is matching the resonance of the pitch. And it wasn't. And that's why I slowed down on those notes. I want it to, to be vibrant. intentionally making sure that my oscillation on my lips is matching the resonance, uh, the frequency of the instrument. So in other words, the valve I press down. And it's very important to be listening for those things. When it's not working, then I, I do a little bit of what we talked about last week, which is I'll tilt my bell up and create some space in the bottom. So. creating buzzing with my lips without them completely sealed against the mouthpiece. And that allows me to not have the aid of the mouthpiece and apply whatever extra um, support I need to with my embouchure itself so that I'm creating those, those pitches with my lips. We talked about free buzzing. So I can free buzz those pitches. I don't recommend spending a lot of time free buzzing, but it's a great way to check and see, are you getting close? It's not the same as playing trumpet. I'll always say that. So don't be practicing it. You can just check once in a while. <laughs> Knowing that I can at least produce what sounds like the same pitch with my lips gives me huge reassurance. When I put my lips up to the instrument and then actually get that standing wave to set up in a motion and resonate the bell, I can just create anything with that sound. I feel like um, it's easy to go anywhere when I have mastered the ability to control the aperture size. So that's a big part of what we do. Okay, so let's go on to compound intervals. What does that mean? Well, we, our first exercise was all about half steps, which are you know the closest, smallest step you can have. And I wanna talk about how this works in terms of an octave and in terms of Western tonality, um, the, the music we normally play. So if you have an octave, C to C, <laughs> Pull that a little. So if I have that octave and I'm playing octaves, right? Then my interval is an octave, which is 12 half steps. So I have one, one option there. In other words, if my interval is an octave, you only have one option, which is C and C. Now, what if we were to take that octave and split it in half? What would that look like? Well, it looks like this. So doing that, now I divided the octave into two pieces. What was the interval? It was a tritone. So a tritone means that we have three whole steps or six half steps. That makes sense because an octave is made of 12 half steps. And now a tritone is cutting the octave in half. So now you have six half step leap up, and another six half step leap up. Now we can divide that up, um, maybe by whole tones, so I can play my whole tone scale. See how that's three whole tones? Let me go this way so you can see my fingers easier. That's three whole steps, or or six half steps, right? And the other one? It's three whole steps or six half steps again. So now we took the octave 
We cut it in half, six half steps, one direction, six half steps the other. We get the tritone as F sharp in the middle of C and C. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, how else can you divide the octave? Well, in even divisions, you could divide it by three, right? So what would the division be? Like, what is your interval to divide it into three? You guys think about it for a second. If you have 12 half steps and you're gonna divide 12 by three, then you need four half steps, right? So. So it's a major third. And if I do another major third, so what I'm doing there is dividing it into thirds, which ironically is a major third. So we have this word called a third, and it happens to be a third of an octave. And nobody ever thinks about that. You're not playing a C scale. And you think, oh, I'm at a third of the scale when you get to the, the, the major third. But it actually is a third of an octave. So if you're practicing your whole tone exercises, if you get that whole tone uh, tonality in your ear to where you can hear it and hopefully sing it, then your ear training is going to improve, but now knowing more than a whole tone scale and the whole tone intervals, you actually know now your major thirds. So you know this. Because it's part of this. And because they're related, all you have to do is make the jump, make the leap in your mind to where they fit. Now we're gonna talk about it a little more. What if you were to divide the octave into fourths? So now you have fourth octaves or quarter octaves, right? What would the interval be there? Anybody? I haven't seen anybody write anything. Actually, somebody wrote something, but I can't read it because it appears to be Mandarin and I'm terrible at Mandarin. It's too bad it doesn't translate. Uh, no, it's Japanese. Um, I can't read Japanese. I know like 15 characters. Robert, good to see you. Um, okay, so how do we divide it by fourths? Well, if you take 12, because we have 12 half steps in an octave, and you divide them by four, you get three. Three half steps is our interval. What interval is that? A minor third. And that is one we covered a month or two ago. And that's the song. Lullaby, lullaby, ba da bum bum ba da da. You all know that, right? So we use minor thirds all the time. A minor third is used in minor keys. So things that we hear in, in minor, which we associate with like soft or quiet or soothing or sad, a lot of times are minor thirds. And a minor third is dividing the octave by four. So. is that? C, E flat, G flat, A, C. Well, it's going to be diminished, right? So because basically your third and your fifth have both been lowered by half step. But instead of thinking of jazz chords or any other kinds of chords, we're thinking of it in terms of intervals. So we divided the octave by four and we got minor thirds. Now the reason I talked about this video as being compound intervals is because really what we're doing is finding most of our really wider and more difficult intervals through the process of combining half steps and whole steps. So our two first basic variations were half steps, this exercise. So we're just doing half.
half steps and whole steps. Now what if we combine both of them? You get minor thirds, a whole step plus a half step. They grow very quickly. As you can see, the half step seems like super tiny. The whole step seems obviously double the size, but not very big. And now suddenly when we get into minor thirds where we added a half step and a whole step interval, we get the minor thirds. You can move around the scale very quickly because remember there are only four notes per octave. And that is where things really start to open up. What happens when you play two minor thirds? You get a... Well, we remember this because it was half of an octave. So that makes sense because if you do the math, we have 12 pieces in an octave. We divide it in half, so you have six and six. A minor third is three plus three equals six. So the minor third is a really important one to know, but it also gives you that tritone. So now what you want to do is learn that in other keys or in starting on other notes. So starting on C, starting on B, You can modulate this however you want. I just did it in half steps. Let's do it in whole steps. You see what I did there? I'm going down my whole step, but still up by minor thirds. So a minor third is gonna give you four divisions per octave. Can you do five divisions per octave? Is five uh, an easy number to divide into 12? Not really. Okay, so we're going to skip it. What about six? Can you do six? Yes, you can do six, right? And six is the whole tone scale, the one we did before. So you can count them, there are six. What intervals can we create with those divisions? If you have, um, let's say the six, which is a whole tone scale, you can get these intervals. So if you practice your whole tones, then you should be able to uh, play all of those intervals, which would be a major second, a major third, a tritone, uh, either an augmented fifth or a diminished uh, sixth, and of course a flat seven and an octave, right? Now what happens? If you use the minor thirds, then you get C to E flat. It's gonna be a minor third. And the next one is gonna be C to F sharp or G flat. That's a tritone again, we've already done it. So it's good to do it again, because it's good to reinforce these things. The next one would be C to A, that's a minor sixth. Okay, and then C to C is an octave. So those are minor thirds. And when we did major thirds, we only had three divisions per octave. Okay, you see where I'm going with compound. They say, Musicians tend to be math-minded uh, type people. I don't know that that's always true, but some of us figure this stuff out sooner than others. And I'm one of those people that did. I spent a lot of time figuring it out. You don't have to, but it will definitely help you as a musician because if you can start to see the correlations between playing whole tone intervals and playing major thirds, then that's gonna help you in the long run, especially when you have uh, either a difficult piece that has some wide interval leaps, you wanna be able to identify them quickly, or you're playing a jazz tune where you're gonna improvise and you wanna understand what that chord symbol means. Either way, you can do these things very quickly just by referring to the intervals you kind of ingrained in your, in your fingers and your playing. Okay, so a major third. Well, that is obviously a major third, C to E, and then E to G sharp, well that would be an augmented fifth, right? Now, that's also a flat sixth. So it could be C to A 
would be a sixth, and to bring it down one would be A flat, so that's C to A flat, and then an octave. So that's a major third. The next interval would be a fourth. If we're practicing fourths, you get this. Now, that moved beyond an octave, but if you continue the pattern, you actually get all the notes. Okay, so a fourth is kind of a special one, because if I play the whole thing, that's an E flat, and if I continue up, it would be A flat, D flat. Which is this. Sorry, I got some water on there. So there I got all of them. Sorry, I got a... Oh, I had a screw loose. That's what it was. Okay, so fourths give you all the notes. And that's why they, there's this thing called the circle of fifths or the circle of fourths. It's kind of the same thing. Um, but fourths gives you all the notes. Uh, the one above that is an augmented fourth, sharp four. That would be the tritone again. And that gives you just two notes. And that's not really going to help us too much because... We only get two notes. It only helps you with, with one interval. And then the last one would be fifths, which is actually exactly the same as fourths. The difference is um, if you play all the fifths, it'll go all the way around the whole cycle and you'll play every note. And it's actually the exact same as fourths if you just reverse instead of going up, you go down and it becomes fourths. So um, questions on that? Let me set this trumpet down for a second. All right. What are your questions on compound intervals? And let's talk about how you're going to practice them. Um, one of the ways I want you to practice them for advanced members who are getting your pocket valves, then you want to use these some of the time, especially when you don't have your trumpet with you or just when you want to make sure that um, you can be practicing and not bothering anyone else with the noise. So. With your pocket valves or not, I can practice my whole tones, right? So I'm going to do a whole tone scale. C, D, E, F sharp, G sharp, A sharp, C, and back down. So that is my whole tone scale starting on C. Um, I can be thinking about the intervals. So can you sing these intervals? Bum, 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 bum. Are you singing um, to imp improve your ear training, are you doing that kind of thing? Or can you whistle them? If you can't do either of these things, what I'd recommend is to maybe pick up your trumpet and play bom, 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 C, D, E, D, C, <clears throat> excuse me, I need a drink. So you want to be able to sing the pitches. Let me just pick up this horn and show you what I mean. I don't care how you sing. I don't care how you sound. You have to be able to think the pitch. Because you should be able to think the first five notes of a whole tone scale and then think the intervals. Bom, 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 bom. So if you can do just even a couple, You've got a good start if you're not sure how to do them. You should be able to do that. If you cannot, this is where the work starts. Now remember I said the first six months, there's a lot to learn. You're going to be practicing these intervals and I want you to ingrain them in your mind and understand how to practice these things and hear them. It wasn't so that you could just have the fingers and, and do that. It was because if you ingrained that into your mind, 
then this next level, which is much, much harder, and it'll make you a much better musician, would become easier for you. Now you need to be able to sing them. And with your pocket valves, or with your horn in hand, you wanna go back and forth. Uh, if you have your horn in hand, you can go back and forth to learn the pitches. Your goal is to eventually be able to do these with your pocket valves, with no instrument. So, this is easy. Bum, 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 because you just heard it, right? Bum, 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 bum. So that's easy to do because you have the horn to reference. What I want you to do is learn how to play these intervals and do the interval exercises we've done before by hearing the pitches. And that's why the pocket valves is part of trumpet momentum. The ASAT, the airspeed aperture trainer, is also part of trumpet momentum. I've given you guys the tools to do parallel lip compression and to learn it, but you may or may not be good at it yet. And the parallel lip compression exercise is basically something that you are learning to do in a way that um, becomes natural. The way to test that and find out if it's actually working is to do it without the instrument. So the ASAT, the Airspeed Aperture Trainer, is going to test you guys and see if you're doing it right. Just like the pocket valves are testing you as well. Bom, 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 bom. So a normal scale, a normal major scale goes bom, 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 right? And we know those pitches. If you do minor, bom, 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 then it sounds different you need to start to learn these pitches and you don't need to know exactly what pitch you're on. It's all about relative pitch. If you can sing the intervals, you're going to be a better player. If you can start to see the relationship between compound intervals um, where you are identifying something like uh, a tritone by hearing three whole steps, that's going to help you immensely. Or maybe you think of it in six half steps, right? Whatever it takes to get you to the augmented fourth, right? The tritone. Um, and it, not just the tritone, I'm talking about all intervals. You should be able to sing all of your intervals as far as your range will allow. So if you can sing two octaves, then you should be able to sing every different interval within two octaves. And eventually we will be practicing those on the pocket valves. So if you know the Haydn Concerto, Bum 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 ba da 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 ba da 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 I'm not the greatest singer, and it doesn't matter. You need to be able to hear those pitches, um, and it really really helps to vocalize it because if you're way off, then you need to stop and correct yourself. Go back to the piano or your trumpet, and you know, reinforce the correct pitches. Don't go doing songs like I just did um, until you really get all the basics down. You want to get through all of your exercises through major thirds um, before you start getting into songs. Okay, so let me see. I saw some comments pop up. I want to say hello to everybody. Um, Okay, yeah, so some people are saying they are interested in um, the daily practice. Now I'll say this, the daily practice wouldn't start until the second week of January. And that's uh, mainly because I have so much going on between, um, you know, the next couple weeks and all the way through then. So um, I won't be able to do it until then. But yes, that is the goal. So I, I'm probably going to do it regardless of what you guys say. But the more of you that comment and say you want to see that happen, have a 15 to 20 minute session every day. I will do it. Um, I'll probably break it up into two different times simply because some of you can watch this stuff anytime all day long if you're retired or you work from home and you have the flexibility. And others, you have very predefined things like work or school and sometimes absolutely won't work. So I want to divide up at least two different times, like maybe Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We do one time in the morning or something and then Tuesday, Thursdays we do in the evening. Whatever it is, we'll figure it out and we'll practice together. All right, um, okay, so I guess nothing says that one has to practice all the way around the circle. I am still working on the embouchure. I find the intervals, particularly minor thirds, helpful in, for controlling the aperture. 
That's awesome. And you know, here's what I have to say about that, Steve, um, is one of the big reasons we do the intervals is because that's what music is made out of. But another reason we do it is because for brass players, we have a specific impedance ratio that we, our brain interprets and feels when we play a musical instrument, a brass instrument. So if we can find the ones that make even divisions of bigger components, like say octaves, um, and master them, then it becomes easier. So let me give you an example. And this is not my mouthpiece. This is the gravity trumpet. Um, it's not my size. So give me a little break there, but I want to demonstrate it because I have it in my hand. So that's pretty easy for me to do. Those are fourths, right? And I can do fourths all the way back up to G. So I can do the whole thing just straight up and straight back down. I probably can't do it very easily on this mouthpiece um, because I'm not used to it. But my whole point is that gives me a reference that my brain remembers. It remembers the feeling of each of those different intervals and each individual pitch. Instead of me thinking, oh, I have to play from a low C to an F. Instead of thinking, oh, how am I going to get there? In my mind, I can figure out, well, um, you know, what does an F feel like? And how does it compare to a C? Well, because I've done so many different intervals and so much work with this, then my brain automatically has like 20 different reference points for the F at the top of the staff because it has reference points from all different intervals getting there, right? And even though I don't practice C to F very often, this one, I don't practice that very often, I do this one. And I don't do this one either, C to A. Right? But can you pick those intervals easily out when you play music? If you saw a C to an A, would you instantly just be like, oh, C to A and play it? The reason that may be easy for some people and harder for others is because some of us can hear the pitch. I can hear a C to an A, and I can hear the interval of a, a sixth in any, in any key. I can hear the same interval um, only, you know, maybe up a half step or down a half step. And I can think of it as either um, uh, a flat seven, or I can think of it if I'm going up. And if I'm going down, I can think of it as an augmented fifth or uh, a minor sixth, whatever I want to do. Or I can just think of it in the correct key. So the thing is, I have so many references from doing it so many different ways, methodically, and I'll be honest, and also having fun doing it that it's easier for me to hit the correct notes. So it, one of the things that I have that will come out in trumpet momentum is a set of dice. And for those of you who are members, advanced members, you probably get a set of these for free just because that's what we do. I mean, the whole point is for me to test these products and on you guys before I release the actual book and the whole series to the public. So with the dice, you roll the dice and some of these dice are going to tell you which intervals to play and some of them are going to tell you which notes to start on. Okay? So, and it may tell you to go up or down, whatever it might be. The whole idea is to do what I've been doing for years and I learned this from, from great players who do it as well. The idea is that you take something that you've never done before and you just try it and see what it does. And then maybe you modulate that in different keys. So if I'm doing a sixth, well, that sounds like. What song is that? I forgot what song it is. But I can hear lots of different songs with the sixth, right? The thing is, for me to play sixth is not a difficult thing. I can start on any note and play a sixth. Why is that? Why can I do that? What happens? See what I did there? I just modulated to a different key. So a sixth shouldn't be a difficult interval. At least for me it's not, for a couple different reasons. Um, I guess probably the first reason is because it's part of this. 
I'm literally playing my minor thirds arpeggios. And the sixth is part of those. I'm going to grab a different trumpet, mostly because I don't really agree with that mouthpiece. <laughs> I keep trying to make it work, but it's not my right size. I've got a Muse Modular in silver and gold. Uh, this one has not been listed on the website, uh, but it's going to go up probably next week. Extremely beautiful horn. The last trumpet you would ever own if you bought this because you can change every lead pipe and bell option infinitely. But um, let me try it on this. See what I'm doing there? I'm playing my minor thirds and I'm modulating down by half steps because I'm practicing those things. But if I can think through those intervals and I master them, then playing a sixth is not difficult. Whatever I want to play, I can find because it's related to um, the intervals and the compound intervals. So start to think of these as building blocks instead of wide intervals. I rarely ever think, oh wow, that is a, a really difficult uh, interval. Like let's say I'm playing a minor, uh, a minor seventh. For me, that feels like this. Um, let's think about it for a second. What is a minor seventh part of? Okay, I don't want to give you all the answers. So if you were looking at all your intervals, which one has that? Anybody know? So think about it for a second. You could take. A whole tone scale and get there. That's like the rudimentary way that's not as helpful. What else gets us there? A major third doesn't. That gives us a G sharp or A flat, but not a B flat. We want that minor seventh. What about this? So what I just played was fourths. If I go two intervals of a fourth, I get to a minor seven. Um, we need to learn these things, right? The only one that really doesn't get represented very well is the major seven. Um, and that's where the word compound comes in, because you can start to make these more difficult. Like I can play a minor third, right? And now I'm compounding it by going up a half step, so I'm adding a half step. Oh, sorry. So what I'm doing is minor thirds, but I separated them by a half step. Minor third, up a half step. That's another minor third. Now I'm going to go up a half step again. Now we hit on compound intervals. That was the first time I actually played one for you. I've been explaining it the whole time. But now we have created the ability to go up a minor third, three half steps, and then start over again a half step higher. You could do the same thing only a whole step higher. Up a whole step. Up a whole step. You get what I'm saying? So I'm now I'm going up by whole steps. A minor third plus a whole step. A minor third plus a half step. You can do those up and down. Can you take your pocket valves or just your pistons on your trumpet and can you sing those? Can you think I'm gonna go up a minor third and then up a half step and then up in a minor third? That's your challenge. And not just for this week, that's your challenge for the rest of your life. Um, but I really want you to work on it for the next month or so this is a huge, huge assignment. Um, and if you can get through even the whole tones and the minor thirds without any compound, and you can sing them all with your valves, just using your valves and singing, then you're doing amazing. Um, when I was in music school, we had to do um, <clears throat> ear training. 
I forgot the name of it. Here, I'm teaching it, right? Teaching ear training. I forgot the name of it. So we would work on ear training. <clears throat> I think we had two semesters of it, maybe. And it was basic stuff. And the way they taught it was they would just ha give you intervals, and you had to learn to sing them all. And they would say, okay, now sing a fourth. Bum, bum. No, it's not a fourth. Bum, bum. Bum, 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 bum. Bum, bum. They would teach us to sing up the scale to the fourth note. And they'd say, oh, you did it. You got a perfect fourth. Ah, da, 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 bum, 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 bum. But some people didn't think in major scale, so they go bum, 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 bum. And they'd play some other note, right? Or sing some other note. Uh, the thing is, that method kind of works and pianists seem to be really good at, at um, sight singing and, and ear training because they played so much piano, I guess, you know, and they, they could see it and, and I wasn't a pianist at the time. It's easier for me now because I play piano, but <clears throat> I never thought that that was a really comprehensive approach. And I went to a very good music school, so nothing against the music school. I think a lot of schools teach this way. But years later, I realized that learning the intervals actually gives you different points of reference that make more sense. Now for a pianist, maybe learning that way makes sense because a pianist doesn't have to match the impedance of the instrument and their air pressure and their aperture to each pitch. And they don't have to adjust that for each volume. And they don't have to adjust it for each articulation. Instead, they push a key, and I'm not downplaying pianists because I love to play piano myself, but they press a key and it's always in the same place every day at the same time. And on trumpet, things kind of move around based on your body, based on the temperature of the room, your mood, everything else can change because if you had too much salt in your diet the night before, that will change the way this works on a brass instrument. So my whole point is this, having all these multiple points of reference using intervals is way better for brass instrumentalists. If you're playing a string instrument or a piano, then maybe the old fashioned way works. But what would really help you is to learn these intervals, learn how to sing them, and then expand your knowledge and think about how they actually become other compound intervals. So if you can find a minor third, and you can do that twice, you can find a tritone. Or you can do it three times and find a sixth. And if you could do a major third, and you do two major thirds, you could find an augmented fifth or uh, a minor sixth. And that makes sense. You're never really going to have a hard time finding octaves, I'm sure. Um, so I don't really talk about that. But what happens when you get up to a ninth, right? So what is a ninth? Then when you get to a ninth, it's just a whole step. If you can hear bum, 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 I'm just playing a D. Or C, D, 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 D. So my voice is just going up an octave, but it's the same pitch, and we can recognize that. So a ninth is actually really easy. Um, if you were to do, um, <clears throat> let's say, a sharp nine, uh, which could be a flat 10. Well, let's call it a sharp nine. What is that? What note is it? Think about it. What is it? It's just a minor third. So if you can sing a minor third and you know your thirds, now you know that interval and so on and so forth. And some of them you hardly ever see written, but they can be played. So start to expand these. So on and so forth. You want to expand your intervals as far as you can, really up to G. Um, above the staff for those of you who've been in for six months at this point. Unless your parallel lip compression, your range and endurance are suffering in your, or you're having some other issues, then please stay lower than that, stay within reason. There's no reason you should be pushing yourself to play too high and then cause undue mouthpiece pressure. Because remember, one of the fundamental uh, precepts in trumpet momentum is that we're using aperture control rather than mouthpiece pressure. So don't forget that. All those exercises we did for months are could be erased if you start using mouthpiece pressure. Gary, good to see you. Sorry I didn't see you there before. Um, 
Sight singing. <laughs> uh, cool. So does anybody have any questions for me before we go? Um, I will not have all of the laser centered uh, hand grips for the pocket valves for a little bit. Let me set this trumpet down. Sorry about that. Um, I should mention what I just played on <clears throat> was the Spectratone Blue. So you could hear it was a little more subtle, warm sound. Um, thank you all who did um, pledge on the Kickstarter for the pocket valves. Uh, we sold out of them yesterday and the Kickstarter closed. Uh, so that's awesome. I appreciate that. Uh, there was a lot of effort put into these, but those of you who have been advanced members for six months as of yesterday, We'll get a set for free. I'll send you an email. <clears throat> I'll get your address, all that stuff. If you ordered any and you want to keep your order and and have an extra set to give away or as a backup or whatever else, you can do that. Um, and I'll have an opportunity for those of you who um, did not get in on this and you're following me here, um, probably in one of the next videos, I'll give you a promo code if you've been following me and you're a member on Trumpet uh, Momentum, if you're a paid member at any level, I'll give you an option to buy any sets that I have remaining. I don't know how many are left. And I'm not sure I'll do a second production run. It all depends on your feedback. When you guys start playing with them and using them and you tell me I hate them or I love them, I'm, you're not gonna say you hate them because they're pretty awesome. But if we get enough people to say they really love them, I might consider making another uh, production run. So, uh, questions for me on compound intervals or anything related to playing the trumpet. I know a couple people asked me last time, can I get one of those shirts? We have a new inventory of shirts, um, so we do have shirts in stock and we have both versions, the color and the black and white. Um, and those are great for, for Christmas presents, you know, because Christmas is around the corner, stocking stuffers. Um, and then besides that, um, you know, on trumpet momentum stuff, on practicing trumpet, I hope you're all staying motivated and excited. I've seen a lot of people out performing, doing holiday concerts, and just a ton of stuff that we haven't seen so much since COVID. So it finally feels like people are just out doing it again, and that feels really good. So um, feel free to share your stuff and tag me if you, uh, you want me to look at any of your videos of your progress. You can tag me on Facebook, Instagram, you can send me your YouTube videos. You can make them private if you don't want anyone to see them, but I'm always happy to help you guys. Um, Steven says, I play in a community concert band and swing band, but chose to play third and fourth parts to protect lips from bad habits. And Awesome, that's smart. That's so smart. I mean, um, I had to do that several times in my career where I just couldn't be playing the lead part anymore because I knew I was having issues. And it's really good to just Make sure you don't push yourself too hard when you're going through, um, you know, any kind of repair or changes in your embouchure, especially if you're going through trumpet momentum and um, aperture controlled embouchure techniques are new to you. If that's the case, you really shouldn't be playing too high. And remember, as you're expanding these things up to the top of the staff or a little above, if you feel like you're using too much mouthpiece pressure and you're not using your aperture control, Go back to the previous lessons and reassess yourself and find out where you need to be. Um, do those exercises. Are you guys doing this? And are you taking that and turning it into a note? Hear how I'm like expanding <clears throat> my air cavity, <clears throat> excuse me, from just my mouth to my lungs and giving it extra? Are you doing that kind of stuff? Because um, that's really, really important. The last couple live videos, we talked about that, and that's paramount. And I haven't done the produced videos of that yet. I just haven't had a chance with all the trumpet builds and tons of orders coming in for new horns next year. Um, but in the next few days, I should have a chance to push go on most of those so you can see them as well. Um, cool, well, I wanna thank you guys for your time. It's almost noon. Oh, it's almost noon. I've got to go. So thank you guys and I'll see you next time.